What happens when one of the largest consumer credit rating agencies in the world becomes the victim of one of the largest data breaches the world has ever seen? Well, we'll explore that more this week on the Data Radio Show. Hello there. Back in 2017, Equifax was the third largest consumer credit agency in the world, which meant that they're collecting data points from all over the place to see how people live and to create a digital picture of what a person is up to, to help work out whether or not they can afford the credit that they might be applying for. But they were also the victim of one of the largest data breaches of all time, which shook things up, not just within the company, but it was one of those sort of defining moments that got people starting to realize just how much data about them is out there in the world being stored somewhere. So how has Equifax changed what they're doing and how did that event impact the way that they move forward? We're going to explore that this week, but before we get into the details, make sure you hit that subscribe button so that you can be kept up to date with all of the content that we're bringing out to help data professionals all over the world. In this week's interview, Julian Redmond from Ignition is going to sit down with Bob Sparshat from uh, Equifax. He is the chief data officer based in Australia. He has first-hand experience of exactly how much work goes into protecting people's data and the learnings that came from that event. Because people might be surprised just how much information is stored on them and where those data points come from. So let's jump over to that conversation. Check it out now. It's uh, Julian and Bob. Let's see what they're up to. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Data Radio Show. I'm Julian Redmond from Ignition, and I'd like to welcome Bob Sparshat today uh, for this interview. So welcome, Bob. Good to have you. Hi, Julian. How you doing? Good. Good. I appreciate you joining us. Um, I think this is uh, quite an interesting chat we're going to have today for the audience. And so, look, let's jump off by letting people know who you are. Tell us a little bit about yourself or your experience, your history, uh, achievements, maybe. Yep, sure. Um, yep, so Bob Sparshat. Uh, so I spent the last 25 years working in, in data. That was that was never really the plan when I started, but um, left university um, and looked for jobs actually in marketing or tourism, uh, tourism marketing, so sports and tourism yep. marketing, um, and uh, couldn't get a job in that space and joined a company at the time called CCN, uh, who, who soon became Experian and started my journey into marketing services, working with data to deliver services to to multiple business across the UK. And most of my clients at that time were pub companies, travel companies. Um, yep. So spent some time there and then and then that role led to another role. I came a little bit of backpacking in Australia, got a job here in Australia and haven't left. So I've been here now for 20 odd years, um, worked across big US businesses, um, so Experian, I'll, I'll, we're a part, well, I work for a partner in, the, in, the, in Australia called Pacific Micromarketing, um, but they're an Experian yep. business now and we're an Experian partner. And then I went to, to Axiom, a uh, similar uh, marketing services business. Um, but as in my latter days there, I started to get more into data management uh, and that led me to a role yep. with Vida, who were, at the time were a wholly owned Australian business. Um, who a year or so after I started, they were acquired by a US business called Equifax. Um, and up until a few months ago, uh, I was with them for the last 10 years. Um, and the last seven years of that, uh, I've been, been their chief data officer, running end to end management of data from everything we, we acquire and bring into the business, store within the, in their environments, and then push out into analytical systems or through products into clients. Yeah, perfect. So you started off in marketing services um, and then you've moved into credit. What was that like? What, you know, maybe give us some, yeah, some achievements. Yeah, look, I mean, it, very much marketing services from what I was doing, really about managing data. Um, so moving yeah. from, from marketing to credit wasn't a big jump from a data management perspective. The big change was regulations. Um, so going yeah. from a marketing environment controlled by the Australian privacy principles into um, credit, which is also controlled by the Australian privacy principles, but far more stringent. Um, what data can be passed between businesses and what's required to be passed from the banks to credit reporting bodies um, is very defined. Uh, and what you can do with that data is very controlled. 
Um, so yeah. It, it, yeah. it was a far more of a controlled regulatory environment. But still, it's about managing data, name, address, date of birth. Um, it's sensitive data for individuals, although that wouldn't be as defined by the APPs, but, but it's, um, uh, it's personal data uh, and you really have to control how you use it, how you store it and, and how it's supplied to other businesses. Alec, I'm, we're definitely going to talk a fair bit about Equifax, but let's talk a little bit before, maybe something you're particularly proud of um, prior to you. Facts. Yeah, probably probably going back to my days at, at Pacific Micro Marketing. Um, they they at the time were experienced uh, reseller of their what was called Mosaic, which is a geodemographic. It's um, a, a classification of individuals, which at the time was was really a, a was really advanced for for sort of segmentation systems. Um, now it's probably a little bit old hat. Um, but, um, but at the time, uh, it was used by every single bank, all the big telcos, all the utilities, because they really didn't know about their customers outside of their own data. So, so one of my, my biggest kind of successes and things that I, I enjoyed most was we, we rebuilt that uh, completely every five years off the back of the census. And in 2008, I ran the major program to rebuild that segmentation and uh and released that to market we did all the presentations took it to market it was a great launch um to to redefine that and um it was hugely exciting I, I i i thoroughly enjoyed that period of my my career although it was at the same time i was having when well, my wife was having kids so trying to do that and um and her kids at the same time was a fairly busy yeah i bet and look i i know plenty of customers who who le leverage that uh data set so yeah, very yeah. impressive okay so maybe we'll bring everyone up to speed then of your role in equifax and uh you know and what you did there um i think it's probably a, you know, yeah, a good chat. yeah so, so i so i've been as I said, for the last i've been there for the last 10 years was there for the last 10 years i left earlier this year for the last seven years mm -hmm. i've been running running everything from the the vendor management side so uh, and that splits into two areas all the banks and utilities um and telcos provide data to to uh, their credit reporting body to be able to access information, shared information that isn't paid for. Mm -hmm. That's that's provided as part of the process, being part of that major exchange. Uh, the other side is businesses where we we acquire data um, to for us to store and provide services, or we license the use of data. Um, so where we don't get to keep the data, um, but we use. Um, other company services. So for example, the document verification store. So a government process, if you want to verify someone, someone exists, um, you go through the document verification score, um, store and it confirms that you're the correct individual with your driver's license and passports. It, it confirms it's your identity really for the purpose of um, accelerating people through applications, uh, but also preventing fraud. So I managed all of that side, all the third party relationships, and then once the data comes in, I ran a, a data engineering team to take that data, standardize it where necessary, go back to providers when the errors in the data, but load it into our environments to build exchanges to deliver services to our clients. I then ran a data management team uh, that was really, once those exchanges were created, making sure that we maintain the quality of that data, the keying and linking was, was accurate, which in a credit environment is really important that you get all the positive and negative data about an individual correct. Yeah. You're not mix, uh, mismatching um, data and um, so you're providing the most accurate data to clients. Um, so that team yeah. managed that or the key and linking and then managed any issues that were, were picked up as we found things slightly wrong. I mean, you, you find things in data where dates of birth are swapped around or you get default dates of birth like first of the first yeah. 2000 and and one would come in quite a lot. Um, so depending on the source, yep. that has changed. And then around our governance team uh, and that data governance team um, really was around how we manage data, um, think access to data, think metadata management, um, making sure that we really had good controls around the data within the business. And then also around a delivery team, which was effectively there when we didn't have 
a product that a client could use to access our services. We wrangle data to deliver those services. And probably yeah. what I should say in that and all of that is that we get lots of data, but our controls around how it's collected and why it's collected uh, and the consent around the purpose for which it is used is, is the forefront of, of what we do, particularly because of the breach that happened uh, a number of years ago. Yeah, well, I definitely want to get to that. I just, I guess for for those listening that maybe don't exactly understand what Equifax you know, you know, does that data sets providing the information that that credit scoring is based on, right? So yes, yeah. You know, so it's kind of important for all of us. We yeah. care about our credit score. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. it, it is. Equifax is kind of the largest credit reporting body in Australia, um, and and as a result, they get access to huge volumes of data from from banks, yeah. telcos, utilities, anybody that's providing credit to um, to individuals. Yeah. And then you build that into an environment to give a, a an holistic or 360 degree view of an individual. Um, so that if you yeah. don't apply for credit, you can look at your history, you can only store in the banking environment 24 months worth of history. You can see that you've been paying off your bills for a period of time. So you as a good, somebody with good credit, you're going to apply for more credit. Mm -hmm. You've got a history of, of, of paying off existing credit, credit cards, mortgages, and therefore a bank is, is willing to lend to you. Whereas somebody who Absolutely. hasn't been paying off their uh, their their credit or have defaults against them, um, those people are less likely to get credit, and it allows the banks to to apply a different approach to those individuals. Doesn't mean you won't get credit; they might put extra controls in place. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's while credit scoring and loan approvals and all those things are probably black magic to lots of people. I think our audience probably has a a fair idea of how that's done but um but you know it is a it is a data set about individuals that holds a lot of valuable you know information that's used for things that affect their daily lives yes so all right let's let's um move on to the meat and potatoes of you know i guess this chat um so there's you know there's obviously lots of changes to the australian privacy rules uh you know and and, and globally privacy rules as well so it's a topic that's on lots of people's minds and you know, and Equifax did have a pretty significant data breach in 2017. So uh, what can you tell us about that? What can you tell us about the impact um, uh, of that particular event? Yeah, so so we we had been acquired a year or two before uh, that. So so we were new to the Equifax world. Uh, um, our data was still very separate and is actually still very separate now because of um, restrictions around cross-border sharing of data. So, so everything for Australia, New Zealand is stored locally here. Um, but at the time we were relatively new, uh, that, that breach happened. Uh, my phone went crazy on Sunday, um, telling me there's uh, something coming out of the press, be aware of it, tomorrow's gonna to be an interesting day. Um, and, and then the announcement came that, um, that Equifax had breached over 150 million people, majority of which were, in the US, but I think it was around 10 to 15 million in the UK and some people in Canada as well. Um, so those records have been breached. Um, and of course that led into an enormous investigation to understand what happened uh, in that process. Um, and I mean, effectively we, we, the business has been hacked by outside entities um, and that data had been leaked. Um, and that led into kind of the in the US particularly, a lot of negativity around the business. Um, even here in Australia, there was a lot of negativity, even though none of our data had been breached, but it, it raises questions. Are you managing your data as well as you should do? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so I mean, like, I know obviously you can't go into the deep details of what happened, but what were maybe some of the things that actually, like, it, you know, it, it changed within the, the business, you know? So to think around security, we had, I think one or one and a half people responsible for security in Australia um, when that happened. It doesn't mean that there wasn't mm. good security in other parts of the business, um, but it was around dedication. Now that team, yeah. I think that team is 20 or 30 people. Um, yeah, right. And we brought in some really, really well-skilled people to manage that area, to manage security. Um, that's where we are now. So what happened, what happened back there? What happened back there was, a, was a, an enormous drive to understand 
what we had and how it was being managed and how secure it was. So it led into a whole bunch of yeah. processes around pen testing and sort of processes around reproducing, um, uh, make sure all of our systems are up to date. So where we had patches that weren't in place, they were all done, making sure all of the things that would be gaps in our, in our uh, defense were closed. So things like CDs, all, all the laptops, all CDs were removed, uh, the USB access, all those sorts of things that, that would create potential issues were removed. Um, we went through a massive data minimization process. Uh, and we actually had a tally going of millions of records that have been deleted. So finding wow. copies of copies of copies of data that were not needed mm. and that an analyst had done or an IT person had done for a particular reason, but had been left there. Um, so we, yeah. we were going through millions and millions and probably billions globally of records that were just removed because we didn't need them which led us into much yeah. better processes around how we manage that going forward, um, how we prevent access. So, so at that time, an analyst in the business had access to, to names and addresses. We removed all of them. Right. Why does an analyst producing a model need access to names and addresses? And my data yeah. management team needed access to that, but they, but so there were a small group of people who allowed access, um, but then we, we have access, access controls that are regularly measured to understand who has access and who doesn't have access and you don't need access to remove the access. Um, so all yeah. controls like that. And then on the governance side, um, there, we just put processes in place to understand what we had, where it was. Um, when we created a new, um, uh, was a new project going on, controls up front. So it was really data governance by design in, in projects rather than getting into the end yeah. and going, okay, you've now finished the project. Did you collect the metadata? Are you clear around where the data is? Have you deleted any copies? All those sorts of things used to happen at the end. Yeah. Whereas now the process is, what do you need to do up front? What does everyone need to understand needs to happen within a project before, it's, before it can be completed and signed off? So a very different approach to, to, to how we were going before. Um, yeah, there's a big education component, isn't there? Like letting everyone in the business understand they have a role in privacy. There, there is, and that, that's actually that's actually a good point um, because one of the things that the business did is is drive us down a kind of global, a compliance process, but a training process mm. around mandatory training. So on a on a regular basis, yeah. every single employee within ECFAS has to go through a mandatory training piece, um, which. Yep. Is about reminding people what they should and shouldn't be doing with data. Um, yeah. And one of the things I've, I've always said to my team is, is that don't think of data in our environment as ones and zeros. They're, they're mums and dads, brothers and sisters, hmm. your next door neighbor. They're the people who, if they knew that you worked at Equifax and you were responsible for or involved in that, uh, in a breach, you actually need to feel that you're responsible. You own it. It's not just about data. You actually yeah. have to feel emotional about it. Yeah, what uh, attitude. Uh, yeah. And the part of that was driven off. I had a trip to, the, to Atlanta not long after the breach, and we were told, don't bring the Equifax bag. Maybe don't tell people you work for Equifax because of the negative wow. impact that happened. Yeah. Um, that didn't happen yeah. here, but um, you really need to think about it's. You, would you be happy if your own parents' details got breached and they got uh, had a some sort of fraud against them? No, you wouldn't. So every record you need to think mm. about that is someone's mum, someone's dad, someone's brother, someone's sister. Yeah, it's a custodianship of people's it is. you know property, isn't it? It is definitely. Yeah. And so thinking about you know obviously there was you know the Optus breach and the Medibank breach and. You know, what do you think's changed in the landscape of data management in Australia since all of these, you know, big events? Um, well, I mean, there's, uh, you look at, look at those two in particular and you look at the impacts to Medibank as a result mm -hmm. that, that are some of the recent announcements around what's going to cost them. Um, you've got yeah. businesses that are really aware that they, they need to manage data. It, it's, it's not acceptable just now just to go, well, IT just manage it. It will happen. It's fine. Uh, the growth of data governance has been immense. Um, 
with mm. AI coming in, a lot more AI focus, not just on building models, but in our environment, but on how you manage data. Um, so there's been there's been a big change in within businesses around how they approach that. Although I think it, it's still got a little way to go with some businesses. Um, yeah. It, for many businesses, it's still seeing a bit of a cost. Um, yeah. Collecting metadata doesn't sound very exciting, knowing where your data is. But there was a breach recently, I can't remember the name of the business, but um, I should do. Um, but one of the things they came back with is we, we didn't have any information around what the data was in that database. So we don't know what was breached. And that's frightening. Oh, you you yeah, need to know yeah. what you've got. So that's internally. Yes. So, so externally, people just know more about what, what businesses do. Um, like 10, 15 years ago, if you just said to somebody, what happens with um, the data you provided to this business, they go, oh, well, they delivered me a service. And most people now are thinking about, yeah, right, what is happening to the data that I provided to this yeah. business? They have my name and address. What is happening with that? So I was a customer mm. of Optus and yeah, I had all the stuff too. coming through. Um, I go, what mm. are you doing with my data? What, I mean, I was still a customer. I am still a customer. Um, and therefore they have the, they should have my information. Um, but what yeah. happens have been a business that I'm no longer a customer of? What have you, have you still got my data? Have you still got my name and address? Um, and I think that's where the privacy laws coming is going to be, is going to be something that is going to be a big focus on, on, on businesses around retention of data. And, and reasons for keeping data. It's, uh, yeah, and that right to be forgotten, which is a whole separate it is, discussion, it is. I think. Well, it, it is. Too, it too is. deep to get into that. Yeah, yeah I, uh, mm. I mean, the the retention piece, going back to the Equifax story, mm. of the 160 odd million records that, that were breached, something like 50% of those were past retention. And so yes, they should have right. gone, but they're in a database that someone wasn't focusing on. Um, if it had been 80 million, yeah. um, it would still have been enormous. Still 80 million people impacted, but it also wouldn't have been mm. the biggest one at the time, which from a commercial um, perspective, they wouldn't have been the business that everyone talked about at every conference, every security yeah. Yeah. synopsis. It's just, it, it, it wasn't a good position because of the volume. It's not, yeah, it's not a race you want to come first in for sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess that kind of leads in, to my... Ideally. Um... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so how how are skills de you know developing you know over the past ten years I guess you know it, like it, it used to just be the you know the database administrators and you know and and you know one security guy um, how do you think the you know the skills of those of us that focus on data management have been evolving over the past ten years? Yeah, I mean a lot a lot of roles that didn't exist. Um, mm. so ML engineers, what was that many years ago? I mean we've had yeah. AI for a long time. But, but it's become, yes. it's become a bit of a buzz word. Also the technologies has accelerated, yeah. put it into the hands of, of the, the non, um, uh, sort of detailed AI analyst. Um, or so mm -hmm. it's in the hands of people like us. We can go, we can all go to chat GPT and write something, uh, and get a bit of information back. Um, but you look at roles. I mean, like 10 years ago, um, yeah, probably 10 years ago, there was nothing, data governance didn't exist. Um, there was, yeah. you, if you go to market, I remember when we first started data governance and you went and looked for data governance people, everyone was like, what, what's data governance? Where do I find these people? Mm. And typically they were, they were compliance people or uh, BAs, people who are good at documenting. Um, it's a completely yeah. different skill. So that, that's grown. Um, as the focus on, on management of data has grown. Um, data engineering. Um, so in our environment or Equifax environment, it was an operational team moving data from one area to another. It wasn't very sophisticated. Mm. It wasn't using uh, any sort of machine learning. Um, now data engineers are really focused, acceleration of data, quality of data, making sure that they're picking up anomalies it's, as it's coming in or before it even hits databases, which is very much where Equifax yes. Is focusing at the moment, so that data engineering role has completely changed. And then you think about the yeah. word data scientist. Now, for years, I've, I've struggled with the word data scientist, and I, I still struggle with the, yep. with the term 
people going to university to learn data science because I think it's actually something yeah. you learn with experience. Um, mm. And um, it's almost like going to university and and taking a, a degree in consulting. Wait a minute, you can't do that. You actually learn to be an analyst and you learn the tools yes. and the data science kit. When science fit for me is means you can actually start applying those in a commercial ex um, environment and you're doing both the analytical and the consulting and it's combining all of that together. What, what we do in university is giving them the skills to do that. But whether you're actually a data scientist when you come out, I think, is a, is a stretch. Yeah. Um, I think Objective, you need, yeah. that, you need that, yeah, that, those skills to be, to be able to apply in that commercial, commercial real world environment. Yeah. Look, I've got one final question because it wouldn't be a podcast in 2024 if we didn't talk a little bit about the impact of AI. So, so where do you think this is going to go as far as you know, AI and how that's going to impact the well, future? That's, that's a big question. Where's it going to go? Um, yeah. um, I mean, one end. <laughs> um, so, look, it's hugely exciting. Um, and um, every conference you go to, everybody talks about AI, every business that a few years ago was offering software, if it, did not, if it doesn't say AI on your website, you're not there. Um, mm. Whether all those businesses are actually doing anything different to what they were doing before or anything that is hugely advanced is another question. Um, but Equifax have been yeah. running AI models for many years. They have a uh, a, a newer decisioning tool that is explainable for credit scoring, uh, which has to be, you can't mm -hmm. credit scoring without being explainable. That explainability is really important in, in models, mm -hmm. particularly in credit models. Um, but what you're seeing is, is, is speed of the ability to do, do stuff. So, um, yeah. I'll give you an example on the, on the credit, I'm sorry, on the, on the data management side. Um, we, for many years, have been ingesting lots and lots of data and have put controls in place on certain variables because we couldn't do everything. And individuals yep. would go, is this outside of the, the standard that we've set? But we might set one standard. Let's say, let's think about rejection rates, reject records that aren't accurate. We might go, if it's less than one or greater than three, that's outside of our anomaly. Let's go and check that. But that's on one yeah. variable. You really want to do it on every variable and you want to have control set in place for each supplier. Because some suppliers' data is better quality than another. And one supplier, they might never be greater than 1%. Another one, they might sit around the 4 or 5% all the time. Um, yeah. So you don't, want to have, you don't want to have your banding going from 1 to 5 because someone goes from 3 to 5, that might be a big jump for them someone else it might not mm. so you want you want to actually be able to do that but you can't have people sitting there staring at spreadsheets and looking at that you need to build machine learning systems which are going to look at that yep. provide sort of what you'd expect to see for this provider over a period of months years and when you see an anomaly you pick up that anomaly before it gets loaded and then that is what the yep. analyst goes and looks at um yes yeah so so it's important to get the data in quickly, but you don't want to get it in so quickly that you miss issues and then have to reverse it out. So what yeah. AI and machine learning in particular brings is the ability to, to get in good quality data quicker and pick up an anomalies quicker, deal with the issue that, and then go back, get it fixed and get it in. So that, that for, Cause they are kind of, yeah. sorry, go on. There's a lot of there's a lot of conflicting requirements because the need for speed to get access to data and load data quickly is, you know, like you know, it's the whole reason that you know data warehouses have struggled and you know and, and then everyone's like lakes will be the pro you know solve all the and then you know it, so I think AI really provides an opportunity you know for AI you know automating the processes that we've actually done manually for a while and allowing them to as you said, expand and look at every variable and every data supplier rather than, you know, some arbitrary thresholds and those sorts of things. And, and it is really just automating a lot of those, those processes and, and, you know, and things like pattern recognition in the middle. So, yeah. and, and it's picking up yeah. things that, well, I've got a good example. We, we had a, um, a client in New Zealand, uh, a bank that provided data, provide data on, on a monthly basis to go into the credit bureau. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things you expect to see in a, 
in a suite of bank accounts is some of them close. Um, but it's normally yep. in the low percentages, maybe under a percent, sure. depending on, on, on who the bank is. Um, this particular month, so it's a, that's an expected thing. You expect to see zeros go to ones or ones to zero. Yep. Uh, in this particular month, um, almost 50% of their, their clients, their book, went to closed. Now, we, we identified this um, after loading because we didn't have an automated process to look at that because you expect to see it and it's a, it's, yeah. it's a normal thing. But it's, it was one of those things we never thought about. Fortunately, one of my analysts mm -hmm. noticed it in the kind of monthly report when that doesn't look right. We went back to the provider. Um, they said, oh, my God, yes, we've made an error on our side um, and we need to fix it. So we fixed it. Um, it, it unfortunately leaves a, lot, a whole bunch of work on Equifax's side because by the time you found it and then investigate it, you had people applying for credit and their accounts closed. So it creates issues. So you have to, there's a whole bunch of work that needs to go on, but that happens. Um, yeah. But we then put in a process to, to evaluate that field. We've never done it before. Um, with, yeah. with, with ML, we go, well, let's just do it on every field. We won't pick. The yes. ones that are most obvious, and we won't rely on an individual to pick it up. Um, yeah. We'll we we'll yeah. rely on the system to tell us this doesn't look right. Go check. What a great example! And look, that's we could probably talk for another three hours on on that stuff, but we're going to have to wrap it up here. I think um, we. I'd love to have you back for another chat at some point. I think that the the whole area of you know of data privacy and you know and regulatory compliance and access control and then the implications of AI, it's uh, it's a big topic. Oh, for I, and to, right to, to be forgotten about. is one I'd love to have to talk about because it's great. Yeah, it's also absolutely really dangerous. All right. If you're happy to come back, I'm happy to have the chat. So yep. let's uh, let's do that. All right. Well, look, I really appreciate you uh, joining us uh, today. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with this group. And, um, and we'll see you very Thank you very much. Hey, I want to thank Bob and Jules for taking over this week's episode. The conversation was absolutely fascinating to sit down and listen to. I had no idea just how much of an impact one event like that could have on how businesses work, on how we see things in our day to day lives. And clearly, it's a really big topic that a lot of people don't understand the nuances on. So it was brilliant to hear some really in-depth conversation around that. Hey, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Make sure you're kept up to date with all of the content that we're bringing out to help data professionals around the world be better at what they do. And if you want to, like the video or share it with others as well. Let everybody know what's going on. Until next time, have yourselves a fantastic week and we will catch you all later.